just like to introduce uh, Jeff Schiller. I think most of you probably have met Jeff or heard him speak before. Been a frequent visitor to BLU meetings, both as a guest and as a speaker. And I'll just turn over to you. I'll take my laptop back. The little bitty network. Yep. My wife collects those. <laughs> she can have mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We actually have a collection we use for the rabbit part, which I'm wearing my Knoxville <coughs> sweatshirt, sweatshirt tonight. Okay. And it's interesting. We have interesting requirements for laptops in the rabbit point. They have to work below freezing. <laughs> I do have a spare dial, um, but I don't know if it can work below freezing point. Yeah. What, what happens As someone who has a bad back, if you have one that small and you don't want it, they don't work. They just don't boot up. They won't boot up. What the mechanism is? Yeah. Yeah. The hard won't stand. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but we actually go through a process of elimination and selection of a number that actually do work. Uh, we use them because we have to handle, we sell rabbits, we have to handle the sales, we have to handle the inventory of rabbits. Which is rapidly changing. Exactly. Well, not only that, but we, we can't commit the mortal sin. The mortal sin is selling the same rabbit twice. <laughs> See, we allow people to buy the rabbit, and then they can go out on the fairgrounds and go on the rides and do other things on the fairgrounds, and then come back later and pick up the rabbit. And so during that period of time, particularly if it's a really cute rabbit, it's you know, subject to somebody else wanting to buy it. And it's really tough, you know, the parents come back with the five-year-old, and we've got to say, you know, uh, there's a little problem. Fluffy is gone. So actually, so actually you use the laptop to keep track of that? Well, we have a whole inventory tracking system. We have ear numbers and coop numbers. How many pairs do you do? Just the one. This is the top field. Yeah, this is the top field field. We run the rabbit park. We're there 20, well, not quite 24-7, almost. I saw your rabbits. Yeah, you probably did. Oh, uh, we had a good year. Nobody got bit. We had these huge signs, do not stick fingers in cages. <laughs> and the first thing people do is they stick their finger. It's worse than somebody sticking their finger in the cage is the parent that takes their kid and sticks their finger in the cage. <laughs> you know what? Your finger looks like a carrot. Exactly. Why Anyhow, not? we're not here to talk about rabbits, so I believe I can go on for a long time. Why are you putting a sign there, stick finger in cage? We're going to talk about... Unless you're putting the rabbits on the internet. Yeah. Hey, my iguana was on the internet, 1994, world famous iguana. Um, sort of funny. Was, uh, the iguana was in Scientific <coughs> American in the November 1994 edition because they came out to take a picture of me because I got an article in there. And uh, they saw the iguana with a webcam on it. Now, this is 1994, okay? And actually, the, the people doing <coughs> the photography were just appalled because, you know, at the time, most of the internet was 56 KB and we were dumping a 128 kilobit stream of iguana breathing. <laughs> <laughs> it was that a coffee pot. Yeah, and it's like, no okay. fish. Anyhow, we're going to talk about the Internet of Things. Um, and, and for those who know me, I, I sort of do security. I worry about security. Uh, and uh, it's a whole new realm, the Internet of Things. Is security your official job? No, actually it's not. The question was, is security my official job? No. Um, my official job is kind of strange right now. Um, I, I'm working in CSAIL, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, on a project called App Inventor, which is a web-based tool to use a blocks language to help kids and actually adults learn to program that when they're done, generates an Android app. So you can actually build Android apps by moving blocks around on the screen. Um, and, you know, if it doesn't make sense for two blocks to fit together like Legos, they don't fit. Um, and it's a, it turns out to be a very powerful paradigm. Uh, because it removes from the programming practice all the hair of where do I put the semicolons, and do I have to indent this, and where does the curly braces go? All that goes away. And so it's about the algorithms and what it is you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and I'll tell you, for kids, they really like this because when they're done, they actually can have an app that they can call their own. They don't only get to use computers, but they get to actually build things. And so we have currently 2.2 million users. Our weekly actives is 100,000, so 100,000 unique people use our system every week. Uh, and we're in 195 countries, which is an interesting challenge for us because there's no good window for us to do things like upgrades. <laughs> um, and so we do a lot of hair to do what I call a rolling upgrade where we upgrade the system that you shouldn't notice. 
unless you reload your browser. But making sure that works is kind of hairy. So that's what I spend most of my time doing. Um, and the other part of my time is I work for, I guess, the office that's changing their name, the Security and Emergency Management Office. So I'm pretty much computer support for the emergency management people, you know, like a building caught fire or one of our cops got killed. Um, the night, by the way, that poor Sean was murdered, uh, we did get activated. I did not drive in. I actually did what I needed to do, which is making sure all the technology works from home. Uh, but I was up all night, and I'll tell you, up on Arlington Heights on the hill, I could hear the explosions in Watertown. It was very, very eerie. I mean, I heard, we heard this noise, like, what's that? And of course, you see on the TV, they throw the bomb out of the, out of the car. It's like, whoa, it's kind of you know, creepy. And of course, poor Sean was murdered right outside the building I work in. Anyhow, be that as it may, so I work with those guys, uh, and, uh, you know, there is an interesting situation. We have a bunch of people who are not supercomputer literate. That's not what they're about. But their technology, when it needs to work, absolutely has to work. And it has to work, you know, our, our emergency alert system has to work if Boston's under three feet of water. It has to work if there is no power on campus. It has to work. So when you, for example, go to our alert system and you register your cell phone, before you leave the page, that information's been updated in five geographically separate locations. Do so... Yeah, may I ask, do you actually use cloud-based services for that? Yes. But not all of it. Some of it's on campus. There's redundant copies in, in two different cloud vendors uh, through virtual machines. Um, and we're using a database, so I'm using a database called CouchDB, which lets me do multi-master replication. Uh, so earlier somebody said, you have to have off-site backups, so we have off-continent backups. <laughs> Take it to the next level. But if you lost everything off-site, you still have everything off-site that you've done it? Yes. So which means even the North America is on, on earthquake, the system will still send you an alert. Yeah. And it got tested. Because the night that Sean was killed, for those who don't know, Sean Colley was a campus police officer who was murdered by the Boston Marathon bombers. Um, major news organizations pointed, their, you know, had links on their web pages to our emergency notification page. And it stayed up. But the secret to that is no secret at all. It's a content distribution network. We use a combination on campus of Akamai and Amazon's CloudFront. Because you can't beat that. Nothing we do on campus can beat that. Anyhow, so that's the other thing that I do. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is I've never had security in my title the whole time I've been at MIT. There was a period of time <coughs> when the security people reported to me. But it was never in my title. And uh, for those who don't know me, from 1994 to 2003, I was the security area director of the IETF for Internet Standards. And so, the, well, I had to approve all security standards for the internet, which at the time included IPsec, HTTPS, um, you know, the, the TLS. And I'll tell you, the hardest part about getting TLS done was at the time we had Microsoft and Netscape that had competing standards. And getting them to compromise on a common standard was the real trick that, you know, to do that. And, that was, and you know, when, you're, when you're running a volunteer organization like a standards body like the IETF, one of the things that uh, you have no power of the paycheck. They are volunteers. And so to be in a leadership position in that kind of an organization is a lot like learning how to sail. You have to learn how to tack the, the craft. You have to figure out how to go in the direction of the wind, even though the wind's blowing against you. It's a lot like that. Uh, you have to sort of address things kind of at an angle sometimes to get the desired result. By the way, John Gilmore has publicly called me an NSA shill. Uh, because you play on words with your last name, but you know. Yeah, uh, and and apparently, you know, because some of these standards that we now believe the NSA may have attempted to make weaker than they should be occurred on my watch. But the reality is, when we screwed up, we didn't need the NSA to help us. <laughs> we did it all by ourselves. And I swear to you, I was not working for the NSA. Anyway, whatever, never attribute to malice what can be attributed to screw-ups. <laughs> sort of a play on that particular one. Anyhow, 
So let me talk about security, because security is actually a hard thing. Okay? And, and one of the things I, I had to deal with on the INTF, and let me advance to my first slide here. By the way, no Microsoft products were harmed in the creation of these slides. Uh, no one ever, ever, ever wants to do security. Okay? And in part, it's because a negative, it's a negative deliverable. I knew somebody who worked in a major organization, I don't want to say because I think I'm being taped, so I want to get myself in trouble here. Uh, and he said to me that every once in a while, he was an incident response, they had to let the bad guys in a little bit. Because if they didn't have some type of scare, senior management wouldn't approve their budget. It's like, hey, what are you guys doing? Where on the bottom line did you contribute? All right? Where? And of course, because security at the end of the day is a negative deliverable. You, it delivers a negative. And you know, the, the guys who have C's in front of their titles don't always get them. Okay? Um, and until recently, in the, in the change, there has been a C change. If I was giving this talk two years ago, I would say to you, no CEO has ever lost their job because they didn't pay attention to cybersecurity. Of course, that's now changed because the, the CEO of Target lost his job. Several times. So now they're going to work on it. But, but I fear something bad's going to happen. Well, the problem is he's lost his job from several companies where he exposed people's PCI. But here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that we've now seen Home Depot is hit. You know, a whole line of these retail operations have been hit. And so what's going to happen is people are going to say, well, you know, that's to be expected. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's just, years ago I used to tell people that, you know, one of the great lies that Microsoft foisted onto us is, let's put it this way, if Microsoft sold cars, okay, we would be driving cars that every three or four miles suddenly sputtered and we'd have to pull off the side of the road, which would be okay because it'd be really extra wide breakdown lanes because they'd get well used. <laughs> And we'd pull into the breakdown lane and we'd open up the hood and we'd wiggle some wires and we'd kick the tires and it would start back up. And we'd get in and we'd drive on. I and like that. if I said to you, do you know it's possible to have a car that can drive several hundred miles on a tank of gas and go thousands of miles before it breaks down? You look at me and say, no, you're nuts. You're insane. People today, when their computer crashes, it's not like, you know, blue screen. This is like, oh, this, is, this is what computers are. And this is scary. Anyhow, oh, another thing that I got in the ITF a lot. When I would say to people, well, you know, you've got to design security into your protocol. I'd say, why? We're not being attacked. The voice over IP people were the really just, guys, you don't get it. I, I guess, I guess it's wrong because USB has now been attacked. Mm-hmm. They didn't build any security measures into it, and now USB is the most dangerous interface we can ever have. And, and, and it's going to get one. worse. Until the next one, this will be even worse. Yeah. So, if you ignore security, you make design decisions that make adding it later hard. My first experience <coughs> with that was the S-MIME security standard. Well, it was the MIME email standard. This is the multimedia enhancements to, to mail. And I actually went to that working group very early on. I said, guys, Please pay attention to security. We got, and they threw me out. Go away. So one of the things that made SMIME, the secure version of mine, hard to do, is that in mail headers, valid MIME gateways can change the case of the headers and can even change the order in which the headers appear. So which means it's an executable file I can, and the gateway can change it into something like a no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, if you're computing a digital signature, yes. you have to compute digital signatures over bits. Yes. And if things can change the bits, you can't compute the digital signature. Yes. Now, it is the case that these guys had no problems with a MIME type application shell. They didn't see why that would be a problem. As long as the dancing bears worked, <laughs> who cares? And so one of the truisms here is that bad guys don't attack your systems until there's enough deployed that it's worth their while. For many, many years, Apple went around saying, hey, we're better than everybody else, and we're certainly better than Windows because there's so many more viruses that attack Windows than Mac. And although I think the Mac was better technically, by the way, this is the Linux group. I like this hardware. This is my Apple MacBook Pro here. But 
for my real work, it runs VMware. I'm running a Linux virtual machine on it. I like using virtual machines because then when I get a new machine, I use rsync to copy my <coughs> And the Mac portion is just good uh, for Netflix and, uh, and those other things that don't work so good because they require Microsoft proprietary group in order to run. Um, and right now, I'm running this display. I'm just running Chrome. I, I didn't boot up the, the virtual machine because I'm running on batteries. And interestingly enough, on this particular machine, there are two graphic cards and two different GPUs. And as soon as you start VMware, it, it wants to use the more power-hungry one. <laughs> and if you're not using the VMware, just running Chrome, it seems to use the, the lightweight one. Anyhow, bad guys don't attack until you deploy to a couple of hundred million handsets. Then they attack. And so I was trying to say about Macs, you know, Apple said, hey, this because the Mac's better. No, it's because your market share was terrible. But now they are, they are top, but, they are, but now it has come to the point that you must install antivirus on Macs. Yeah. Because guess what? And what's interesting is it's not that the market share of the Mac has gone up tremendously, though it has, but it's gone up in the interesting parts. Okay? If you go into an airplane, you will see most of the Macs are in business class and first class. They're in the hands of the people who actually have the secrets you want to steal. Now, moving on. One of the things as a security person I have a real hard time with is I say to people, you know, What's your threat model? Now, of course, if you use a technical term like threat model, you know, the eyes roll up in the back of the head and they don't know what you're talking about. But, you know, so you say it in simpler terms. You say, who's the bad guy? What do you worry about? And by the way, most people are really bad at understanding this. When I was doing consulting here at MIT for, for the Benefits Accounting Office, and they wanted, they were worried about security, and I said, so this is the benefit, I think it was the, be yeah, benef the be excuse me, Benefits Office. We'll come back to this. Benefits Office. I said, who, do you, who's, who are you worried about attacking you? And I expected to hear the students, outsiders. No, they said the Benefits Accounting Office. <laughs> really? So, what's your threat model? What are you protecting? Now, universities are interesting that way because guess what? If you break into our systems here at MIT, for the most part, you're not going to steal a ton of money. We're not a retail operation. We don't have millions of credit cards on file. So if what you want to do is steal money, we're not a good target. And that made us a soft target when we, were, when we had these DDoS attacks. What happened was we became a target after the Aaron Schwartz debacle, where we got attacked by hacktivists, people who were angry with us, who were going to teach us a lesson. Now, we hardened our network since then. So we're pretty good. They're not going to get us as easy next time. But we had to understand what our threat model was. Our threat model changed. Fortunately, we're MIT, we can rise to the occasion and we were able to deal with it. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, if you're a bank, okay, they're going to want to take the money. By the way, an interesting system to look at, and I say system in the broad sense, is to look at Bitcoin. The whole Bitcoin economy, right, as soon as you put Bitcoin on a computer, it's not a computer anymore. It's a cash machine. People have stories about they had a Bitcoin wallet on their computer, they took it into the repair shop, and the Bitcoin got stolen. <laughs> how could that happen? Hmm? Yeah, how could that happen? This is, this is possible because Bitcoin is anonymous, so if you can disguise yourself, then you can take the money. Yeah. Um, there was a, uh, a Bitcoin exchange. By the way, Bitcoin exchanges are interesting. These are places where you can turn dollars into Bitcoin and exchange other cryptocurrencies. There is a Bitcoin exchange just inside, just in front of the Corp. Co no, no, that's a Bitcoin ATM. Right. It's not an exchange. Very different. Though some of what I'm about to say applies to it, okay? Because the people who start, first of all, who is attracted to Bitcoin? Okay? You know, a friend of mine many years ago had one of the very few EV1s, the Saturn electric vehicle from GM. And he was a member of the users group. And he says the users group divided into four classes. There were the tree huggers the movie stars, the ordinary people, and the geeks. He was one of the geeks. Well, Bitcoin has the geeks, but then it has ordinary people, then it has forward-thinking merchants, and then it has thieves. People who are attracted to it because they see an opportunity to steal, and some of them open exchanges. There's one exchange, BTCE, which I have this theory that their business model is they rob every tenth customer. <laughs> 
that you deposit the money and they take your money. If you try to find out physically where they're located, the domain name records point to, not, to, not, to, to you know, anonymousness. It's believed that they might be in Russia or Ukraine, but nobody really knows. Okay? By the way, you know, point of order here. You're going to send a ton of money to somebody, you should send it to someone you know. <laughs> Anyhow, so my theory is they steal from every tenth customer because then when that person goes on Reddit and complains, nine other people say, oh, it works fine for me. So uh, that's their model, you know, and they get away with it. Anyhow, but my point here is that Bitcoins change things because it changes the threat model. And if we have more time, people want to talk, I can tell you all about Bitcoin. I have all sorts of opinions on it. Now, the theme of this talk is the Internet of Things. Now, things have a really hard time because things, people don't think of them as computers. The nest is a thermostat, right? It's, a, it's even round. It goes on the wall. Okay? When was the laptop last time you updated the firmware in your thermostat? When was the last time you updated the firmware in your car? So, will they get patches? Probably not. Nest just recently put out a patch. Yeah, well, Nest is actually an interesting case because they're Google. Um, chances are, when you do, if you do need to update them, if you're the manufacturer, chances are you may not have access because they're behind a net, which the bad guys won't have a problem with because they don't have to abide by such subtleties as the law. Um, so, and here's an interesting thing. I, I wrote this slide just yesterday. I call this proportionality, which is to say there's a, there's a price to care ratio here. Years ago when I was talking to somebody about making sure his computer was up to date and patched and all this great stuff, he looked at me and said, you know you're nuts. You're expecting me to pay attention to this computer and waste a lot of energy worrying about it it costs a heck of a lot less than my car, and I don't put that much care into my car. <laughs> so people, and I think it's true, people put care in as proportion to how much they're invested in it. And a, you know, $10, or all right, the Nest is not a $10 thermostat, but if we look forward to the Internet of Things, it's not going to be successful until it hits the, the thermostat price point. Okay? In fact, most thermostats are not installed by people, they're installed by contractors who do renovations. Okay. Oh, look at my new room, it's painted and it's all great. And this, of course, there's a thermostat because we want it to be warm during the, during the winter and cool during the summer, so we have a thermostat. I'm not going to think that, what's that thermostat going to do? So what do we have to do? <laughs> Things must be secure out of the box. Period. That is so vital and yet so ignored. Years ago, I was talking to, to uh, I forget which vendor, which is just as well, the mm -hmm. controls vendors, the guys who make little actuators that adjust the temperature in rooms like this one, because they were putting these things in MIT. And I said, you know, they were going to put them on our network. Of course, most places they install these things, it's in a company behind, you know, in a behind a firewall. And of course, we didn't have one at the time. And so I said, what's your security? And they said, oh, the Binary protocol messages you use to control this thing uh, are unpublished. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't this a common error that if you if you disguise something, it w w will still not be safe because someone can reverse engineer that? There's things you can do. Default passwords should not exist. No, not even the one you keep a secret for. It's only for your field maintenance people. I don't know how many times I've been burned by that or heard about people who burned by that. It's like, what were you thinking? <laughs> Assume no maintenance. And this is just from the other day. You've seen this article? And several others. So there's a website out there that aggregates the feed from 73,000 cameras that people have installed that they haven't changed the default password. <laughs> and so now you can go and look at people's homes, Parking lots, I mean, I'm sure it's very gripping, you know, video to watch. <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, it's like, uh, that's why, not a good idea, not a good precedent. So, if, yeah. I could, if I could take a, a slight diversion here. So, you know, when, when we were talking about, you know, Home Depot and Target and, and these big companies being hit, you know, 
there's financial damage because there's there's data leaked about you know things on a huge aggregate scale. I think a lot of people aren't thinking about um, information leaked about a particular person's you know current location and things like that that aren't necessarily oh my god they stole my money. So for instance, you know I looked into Nest and you know they make it sound in the ads like oh you control it with your your phone. Well, you're not really controlling it with your phone. You're talking to some server, which happens to know when you're going to be home and when you're not going to be home. So that's you know other companies gaining more information uh, about you, and that's even the legal part of it. That's assuming nobody else is able to get into that information. Well, you know, the funny thing is the reason we haven't had people robbed through that kind of an information leak, this is my theory, but we know, <coughs> we know. So we know but is there's so much stuff out there there's so many ways to get to to steal that they haven't gotten to that level. Why bricks breaking into your into your house? If I can, I'll give you an example. This is another great place where Bitcoin's being used. That's great with quotes on it. You've all familiar with heard of Tor and hidden services, which apparently aren't as hidden as people thought. But we'll leave that aside for a moment. You you mean the Tor for secure browsing? Yeah. Right. Yeah, we started talking about last one. And, and so the thing is, you go there, and there are websites in the hidden web that you can only get through via Tor, therefore you don't know where they are, where you can buy PayPal accounts for Bitcoin. So for $10 in Bitcoin, they will sell you a PayPal account that they guarantee has got $1,000 of potential to be stolen. So I guess they give you the username and the password. And what these guys have done is so what they're outsourcing is they're outsourcing the risk of getting caught when you actually steal the money. That's why they'll sell it for ten dollars and you might get a thousand dollars because you're taking a bigger risk of getting caught. Well, it's money laundering. Basically. What? Yeah, it's money laundering. Well, so it's, it's, it's aiding in technically and theft. Yeah. Aiding and money laundering. Yeah. Yeah. Another <laughs> thing that uh, the safes in your hotel rooms. How secure are they? If you lock yourself out of your safe, you just call maintenance, they'll send up a maintenance guy to open your safe. And actually all safes have default passwords. Yes. And many of people, including me, don't know how to change the default password when I enter a hotel. Yep. Well, my favorite was the kind that there isn't a keypad, instead you swipe a credit card. Mm -hmm. And it learns the number, you know, the information on the stripe, and then you do that to unlock it. Well, that's not as that safe. I didn't tell you have to change your path, your credit card because the account number was stolen at Target. Yeah. Ah, well, except but except during the life of a hotel room stay, you know, oh, just yeah. don't throw away because it's not it's not talking to the credit card network. It's just reading the mag stripe. Yeah, but they've already given the hotels a credit card copy, so they, I don't know if that's increasing. No, it doesn't increase. I'm saying I like that because at least it's more secure than one where you have to pick a number. Or where you have to use the number that's already there. I need to figure out how to turn off the screensaver or talk faster. But anyhow, uh, bottom line is is that uh, there's lots of the cool thing. But they don't have to break into your house. If I want to steal money, I just go to one of these websites, and it wasn't like there was one offer. There was pages and pages. And now, by the way, the guy stealing credit cards. They offer them for sale based on geography. I can say I'd like a, a credit card that's near me so that when I go into the local Target and, and, and you know, buy stuff with somebody else's credit card, it's someone who lives in the area so that doesn't trigger, you know, doesn't trigger a lot of suspicion alarms. And all this stuff is out there, you know, I'm going to break into your house. I can steal the money online. So what to do? One of the things, when I do private consulting, okay, there really is no substitute for getting a, a security expert in. Okay? And it's not self-serving because I don't have the time to take long-term you know, commitment. So I'm not trying to sell them that they should pay me a ton of money and I'll help them because I don't have the time. But you're really, you know, and the problem, of course, by the way, a lot of security is done through the audit division. Okay? Auditors require security. But auditing security is based on a guy shows up with a clipboard with check boxes. You got a firewall? Ding. Okay, check that box. You got antivirus? Ding. Check that box. In fact, uh, my favorite or least favorite check box routines is the uh, PCI DSS. 
payment card industry data security standards. Mm -hmm. All right, it's a bunch of check boxes. In fact, when we you know decided we had to go through that here at MIT, uh, I remember talking to the executive VP and I said, we have a problem. We can optimize for security or we can <coughs> optimize for compliance, but these yield different solutions. The optimal point for security and compliance are not at the same place. Oh, by the way, if we are breached, we are in not we are non-compliant by definition. <laughs> so which one do you want to optimize for? And <coughs> isn't it in their self-interest to make things more secure? Well, when I said it that way, that sort of steered them in that direction. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's a problem. Um, Target was PCI compliant. A lot of good it did them. Um, so there's no substitute. You know, Ted Cho, who used to work for me, is a good friend of mine, on his office door here at MIT. By the way, if you don't know who Ted is, uh, it's Mr. EXT4. Uh, yeah. uh, Ted. Ted had a great thing on his door for many years. It said, well, it was there for many years, but I remember it from many years ago. It said, smart is good. Being clever is even better in a pinch. But there comes a time where there's just no substitute for knowing what the hell it is that you're doing. <laughs> and there's not many people who actually know what they're doing. And, and you know, we're, we're not in college, we're not training people to know this stuff. And part of the problem is, is you can't train for this. You've got to know how to think. You know, Whit Diffie many years ago, uh, you all, you've all seen Galloping Gertie, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, the collapse yes. of the Gertie <laughs> falls in. Whit Diffie told me once, he said, that was an engineering failure, but it wasn't a security engineering failure. And the way you can tell the difference is the wind did not learn how much fun it was to blow down bridges. <laughs> <laughs> and so, when you're in security, you're not going up against a natural phenomenon. You're going up against a living, breathing, thinking, scheming, morally da damaged individual. And that makes it very hard. All right, enough of that. Plan on updating firmware. I don't care how good you are, your code's going to need to be updated. Software, for the most part, should be in read-only memory. This is something Android mostly got right. Well, if you have an Android phone, everything but the slash data partition is read-only. So, so slash system, where all the system binaries live, is actually read-only. Oh, so, so, so the rooms here, you don't mean physical rooms, or something that is read-only? Hmm? So you don't mean physically rooms, but something that is, you, you simply can't write. Yeah. Like a hard drive of write protection. But on the other hand, you still got to be able to do an update. Right. So you have to have an escape hatch. And it has to be very well guarded. Where do the apps live? Uh, they live on slash data. Yeah. So the, the carrier installed bloatware lives in slash system, which is why you can't make it go away. But there are some carrier programs which can be blown away you know, through special means. Well, this, well, first of all, if you root the phone, you can remount system read-write unless, the, car unless the, the vendor of the phone has done something at the lower level to make the memory read-only, which some do. Uh, you can then go and delete things. And there's also a package.xml file that describes all the packages, and you can remove it from that or mark it as disabled. So this thing's you can do. But my point is that by making most of the operating system code read-only, you protect it fairly well. Um. I mean, most of what we call malware that exists on the Android platform it's not like traditional malware or viruses like we would think of in a computer. They don't, they don't, have, they don't have the ability to install rootkits. They can no. only fake, fake to be something that can... Yeah, most malware, right, most malware in Android sends text messages that cost you money, it exfiltrates your uh, contacts and sends it out to the, the, the bad guy's server. And how does it have access to your contacts? Well, because it had a permission that you said was okay. Because it's in its XML and signed. So. You also need, when I talk to hardware vendors, right, I say, you know, doing an instruction that does the AES encryption cipher, that's pretty cool. The, the uh, newer Intel chips do that. Which is, by the way, I like because uh, I'm running VMware, but there's no performance penalty when I run an encrypted virtual disk from my Linux partition because it has bare access to the actual AES encryption instruction, so it runs just as fast. But on the other hand, if you didn't provide me an AES instruction, which 
you know, if I'm a small little device, you know, we may not want to devote the silicon to that. And unless we're doing some real media streaming, we probably don't need to do encryption that quickly. But what I need, desperately need, that I cannot substitute is a source of entropy, random numbers. Mm. Actually, does a pseudo random number generator work? I don't know. No, you have to seed it. The problem is, yes, I mean, there's an, in the crypto community, there's an argument that's been raging for years that says if I need 3,000 <coughs> random bits, do all 3,000 have to be purely random? Uh, you know, be, can it be 3,000 bits of pure entropy, or can I start with 256 <coughs> bits of entropy and use a good pseudo random number generator to stretch it out? And there are arguments on both sides. Okay? I'm sure somebody at the NSA knows the true answer, but of course they're not telling us. <laughs> and maybe NSA knows. But that's the thing that if you don't have at least some seed entropy, I, I, I remember there was this uh, bunch of keys were cracked maybe a year, maybe two years ago. Um, from, from which part? Somebody did a scan of, of certificates on devices and on computers, SSL certificates, and then did a study and discovered some significantly large number had the same public key. And they found out that it, I don't remember that, that one, one, the database maintainer of OpenSSL commented out a few lines to read. No, I'm not talking about that. Th right. That was that issue too. That was really egregious. No, I'm talking about a different issue that came later than that. Right. Where not only were there lots of machines that had the same exact public key, but it turns out that if you are, if you have, the RSA is based on multiplying two large primes to get a large composite number. Yeah. Okay? But if I have two compo large composite numbers, that share a common prime, then it's game over. Because I can do the least common divisor out. See, <coughs> the factoring algorithm, taking a large composite number and turning out its prime factors, that's hard. That's NP hard. But taking two composites that have a common factor, that's quick. That's quick. In fact, not only is it quick, it is so quick that what they did was you don't need two, you can have a thousand. They took all these keys and multiply them together and watch the primes fall out. <laughs> now this is really, really bad because if I found two devices that had the same public key, that means they have the same private key, which means they know each other's key. But if I have two devices that have one prime in common, then not only do they know each other's private key, but I know the private key. Okay. And so does everybody else. Now it turns out, and this is one of the things that shows you security is hard. In the code of OpenSSL, there's code in there that says generate the random prime P. Yes. Then mix in some more entropy. Um. Then generate the random prime Q. Yes. Multiply them together, I got the public key. The problem was, lots of these keys came from devices that were embedded devices or home routers where you power them on for the first time, and they have no source of entropy. And you never power them down. And no, it's not that you never power them down. The first thing they do after they boot up is they generate their keys. <coughs> and they have no entropy, or very little entropy. So there's a high probability the two will start with that same P. Uh -huh. And because they mix in more entropy afterwards, there's a higher probability that they'll have a, the same P and different Qs which leads to this horrible problem. So I actually argued with some of the folks on the crypto list. I said, you know, if they had just taken the first random number seed and generated P and Q, then it would at least have the same key, but it wouldn't be only one prime factor in common. So by attempting to make things better, by mixing in more entropy between the two generations, you actually made it worse. Now, of course, the counter-argument was, if you have no entropy at startup time, you're already dead. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. And that's the point. You have to have a source of entropy. Give me a hardware random number generator. Now, there's a lot of people who have said that Intel chips, and the modern Intel chips, do have a hardware random number generator. Okay. A lot of people say, well, we think it's got a back door for the NSA because Intel won't tell us how it works, and they won't let us get access to the raw bit stream. They only give us access to the pre whitened stream after it's been moaned around to have the right properties. So that could hide a back door, blah, 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 blah. If the NSA wants to bug my thermostat to find out what temperature it is in my living room, they are welcome. 
If they want, I'll even call them and tell them what the temperature is. Okay? So for the Internet of Things, most things are not going to be storing national secrets. Okay? We just want to keep the schmuck who's stealing PayPal accounts to make ten bucks. Those are the guys we want to keep out. Doesn't that lead to an issue if there is a backdoor in it and it leaks out? Well, <coughs> it depends on what the backdoor is. And of course, well, in the yeah. case of, of the Linux dev random, okay, mm -hmm. where people say, oh, you shouldn't be using the read random instruction, that's the access to the intel. It's always safe to use it as long as you mix it in with the other sources of entropy and it can never hurt you. One of the things people don't get. Adding more entropy, even if it doesn't have good entropy, even if it has, if it's, a, if it's a value known to your adversary, doesn't hurt you. So it may help you, can't hurt you. Probably should do it. But on the thermostat, you're only going to have probably your one source. Yeah, temperature of the room. I know. I, Thermal noise. Yeah, I know. I know my PC. Um, I used to use Debian. Whenever Debian boots up, it will. I don't use Blue Splash. I know what's going on. And there's one line saying generating system entropy. I don't know what I'm doing. There's always a line saying generating system entropy. Well, the problem is. A lot of these embedded devices have no UI. I mean, the classic source of entropy, if you don't have hardware, is the end user. You remember the old PGP program, they tell you to type random stuff in. I remember in. that every time when I want to generate something from you random, if I don't play music, it was stuck there. Well, you random, yes, yes, it's one of the debates on the crypto list is should you random ever block? Right? And there's people saying, no, the whole point of you random is it doesn't block. And in fact, most implementations, that don't block on you random, when you shut your machine down, it writes out this, the random state. Though it's very clever, it does some hashing on it so that if you learn that random state, you can't use it to figure out what numbers were generated prior. And then you use it to seed the, start seeding the random number generator when you boot up. The problem again is these devices you take out of the box that have the same state as every other box, you know, device you take out of the box. You're saying you have to. You have to put them into the box of entropy already generated. That or you have to have an entropy generator yeah, built in. For both. But an entropy generator can means an extra chip. Well, yes and no. But yes, I mean that's the argument. Is it, it's real estate, right? Right. It's real estate. It's spending money for security, which your customers don't want. Which, by the way, I don't have a slide on this, but I think it's worth saying. One of the real problems in security, and when police, particularly when it comes to consumers, is the consumers don't know how to evaluate security. So if I spend a ton of money on my product and I make it secure, and I say, the differentiator of my product is mine is secure, my competitor, who hasn't done squat, they say, mine is secure. <coughs> and unless I'm an engineer, I don't know. That's right, consumers don't know the difference. What they do know is that guy's product is $3 cheaper. <laughs> That's what they know. It's either cheaper or slightly faster, and you're screwed. You say, well, we're the good guys. We're the good stuff. The other guys go, so are we. <laughs> there was one vendor years ago on, the, on, on old Macs that sold a hard drive encrypting program, full disk encryption before it was a fad. And they claimed it was unbreakable. But I looked at how it worked. And the way just reading the specs meant they had to be hiding the key on the disk somewhere. OK? And so I confronted them, and I worked my way up through the hierarchy, and I actually got to an engineer. And you know what lame nonsense they told me? They said, well, when we say it, it can't be broken, what we mean is we don't sell a product that does it. <laughs> uh, okay. And so the problem is, you know, the average consumer can't tell the difference. Okay. But the risk that companies take today for not doing security well, like in the case of these cameras, is if a security exposure becomes available and suddenly you become exposed, you can sue them. You, you're going to say, I'm not going to do business with those guys again. And you can sue them, actually. Yeah. Well, you can sue them. Maybe you'll win, maybe you won't. Maybe it, there's an arbitration clause that says you got lose, right? Um, I mean, I. Yeah. All right, let me move on. We can come back to this. Software update. You can't push updates to embedded devices. They have to poll for an update. Because that's just the way the network tends to be in people's homes. Because, because they are behind the NAT and the routers? It's behind a uh, NAT box or something, right. 
Now, you must authenticate updates, which really means they need to be digitally signed. Isn't the most Linux distributions sign their packages, and Microsoft also sign their packages mm -hmm. for their updates? I think this is a very common thing. But there's a problem. There have been several cases, and actually more every day, where the private signing keys of these packages have been disclosed. In fact, there was one example involving a common driver used on Windows where the private key of the company was disclosed, and it was used by bad guys to sign malware versions of the driver. I know that once Stunksnet made it through the Iranian security because this stole, they stole the key from Realtek. I understand, but there's been others. I mean, if there's only one case, and in Stunksnet, which was a state act, right, I wouldn't be so worried. But this is happening more and more. And what's interesting about this is I forget what company it was that this happened to. The obvious solution, of course, that people think of is, well, gee, you revoke the key. But they couldn't. Why? Because if they revoke the key, other devices using the authentic driver will fail. Exactly. There might have been 100,000 or a million devices that had malware that you would protect, but there's 10 million that you'd break. So what did they have to do? They used a traditional antivirus, anti-malware approach, which is you have something that looks at the signature of the bad actor, and you, and you eliminate it <coughs> that way. You actually couldn't revoke the key. So now, but there's a problem. The problem is, so how do you, what, why are these keys getting stolen? How is that happening? And the answer is, people remember the secure ID tokens that got compromised? Yes. From secure ID? Does anybody know how that happened? They broke into Git. Well, I will speculate how. But let me do this slide. <coughs> Most software is stored in a version control repository. Most software at most companies has some type of automated build system, Ant or Maven or Make, you know, pick your poison, right? right. And so you, 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 take, you check out the source tree, you type Make, and it grinds away for a little time or a lot of time, <coughs> and bingo, it's done. But if part of this means generating a signed package, where do you get the key to sign the package? I stole it in my software repository, and that's the quickest way. Right. Because a build server can read the key and sign it. And this is great for, this, for your continuous integration server, you're running mm -hmm. Jenkins or anything like that. You'll put the bloody key in the repository. And uh, the problem, of course, is as soon as you put it in a repository, it's available to some huge number of people you know, within the company. And all, who, all now will become a target. Because all the spear phishing that goes on, you, you try to get the login credentials of somebody who's not very interesting in the company, who's probably not a security expert. But if they have access to the source code repository, and the source code repository has the private key, you're done. Now, the other problem you have is, well, one solution might be, well, guess what? All your developers don't need to have the production key. So maybe with a key you put in the source code repository is a testing is, key. Is a test key, and all your developers, you know, the production key is held by the production people who do the actual real packaging of the real release. Well, guess what? Who are your likeliest employees to not understand how to protect the key? Protection people. It's the production people. They don't know how it works. Right, it's magic. Yeah, because I think developers know the process more than a uh, exactly. Designer. Now, I speculate the secure ID token, so, so the, met, the keys that were inside all those tokens were stolen, okay? Now, we use those at MIT. When you buy secure IDs, at least back a couple of years ago when this happened, what you actually got was you got a whole pile of those little hardware tokens and a CD-ROM <coughs> that contained the keys that you fed into their software that would then eat the CD-ROM and, and then initialize, and then you could, you could program, you know, you could say who the, talk, you know, who the token belonged to. So that had all the keys on it, obviously in some form that us mere customers weren't allowed to see, but you know, they were encrypted in some keys stored in the software, but obviously not that well protected. Well, guess what? Somebody has to burn those CDs, and they're not security experts. And chances are those <coughs> keys are stored on some you know, unprotected Windows server that was never patched, that you know, sits in the corner of the, of, the, of the loading dock where they do these things. <laughs> and so it was a sitting duck. Or they're unused and they get sold at the MIT fleet. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. it's really hard. Now, of course, one of the things, people put stuff on GitHub, right? And GitHub implements, you know, multi-repository. <coughs> and so somebody discovered not very long ago 
that you know Amazon access keys that are used for accessing you know Amazon's services have a very well understood regular expression to them, and you can search on that and bang, they all fall out of GitHub. <laughs> the only reason you can't do that today is GitHub put a special hack in so that you can't search for Amazon Web Services keys, but they still send people, get them the hell out of your repositories, and oh, by the way, if there is one in your repository, you've got to change it, because it's compromised. Um, the other thing that's very hard. Speaking of tokens, um, I was pretty impressed with uh, the YubiKey when I first heard about that. Mm -hmm. Are there any issues with that, or is that the, 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 the silver deal? It didn't work with anything. Yeah, exactly. It's so secure. It's actually, it's, thank you for raising that. I actually have one of the FIDO keys. Right? I actually have, I have the old <coughs> that I bought years ago at home, which wasn't useful for this. I have, there's actually this thing called the YubiKey Neo, which does, you know, three different things, but, I, but that's $50, and I bought the $17 FIDO key. That's actually very interesting technology. If we have time, I can come back and say how that works. Yes, that could help. Then you could put the secret on this token, and obviously you need to have a backup somewhere. Uh, and you say to production people, you put the token in the machine when you sign the driver. Okay. So yes, there are technological approaches that you know are now becoming available, which are really kind of cool. Like maybe TPM, which I mentioned before. Although we might not rely on that, but <coughs> they can at least somehow securely store a key. Well, it turns out what these little final guys are are a stripped down TPM on a USB stick is, is really what they are. Uh, with the additional feature, which a TPM does not have, which is you have to touch it for it to do its magic. The problem with the TPM is once a TPM has been activated and the keys are in it, malware could take advantage of it by feeding it things to sign. Right. Whereas this key does not generate a signature until you touch it. So there needs to be some user interaction which the remote bad guy doesn't have access to do. Or maybe just sort of key a smart card, and if they don't carry their smart card, they will be fired. <clears throat> Anyhow, there are solutions, but you know you have to know to do them. Right. right? I mean, for a lot of the stuff out there, you know, there's solutions, but they cost money and people don't understand how to do them. And, and I bet you if I went into the, the production department of, you know, Secure ID, well, now I'm sure they got religion, but you know, before this whole thing happened, then I said, we're going to change your process so that you have to get this stupid thing and stick it in there. And oh, by the way, you can't lose it, and it really should go in the, in the vault at night. Yeah. In fact, you know what will happen? Here's the, you know what the failure mode is? The failure mode is the guy who's in charge takes it home with him. Because, by God, to put it in the safe next door will take 10 extra seconds. When he can just stick it in his pocket, go home, and he's going to come to work tomorrow before everybody else anyway, he'll have it with him. It'll be good. Two-party control fails that way too. A project I was on required two-party control and create certificates. Yes. And the other person, <coughs> and I was the techie guy, so the other guy was a senior administrator kind of guy. He lost his key. No, he didn't, it was too much of a bother for him to come to the computer room where the box was. So he said, Jeff, find someone else, okay, to do this. So I found somebody who was another techie in my building, so he became the second key holder. And then one day, I called him up saying, hey, we got to go do this. He says, you know, I'm really pretty busy. It's in the coffee cup on the second shelf in my office. <laughs> and, you know, the process devolved into whenever I needed to sign a certificate, I'd go into his office, which I had a key to, take it out of the coffee cup, I'd go into the computer room, stick the two keys in, do the thing, go back, put it back in the coffee cup, lock the door. And in theory, we had two-party control. In reality, we didn't. All right. You are comparing the two keys. Because, you know, I trust me. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm not a bad guy, so I don't feel bad doing this. I need to get the... That's the other thing. I needed to get these things signed. The problem is, if I went in and I said, hey, guys, you've got to do this new production thing in this other way that's going to be less convenient and slower, what they're hearing is, and if this makes us go slower, we get in trouble. Because we're going to be judged on how many things we generate. Rather than how secure. Or how secure, because again, security is negative deliverable. You know there's a Dilbert on this. There's a Dilbert where, where uh, his boss is saying to him, you don't generate a, whole, a lot of stuff. In the time it takes you to generate one application, Zimbu the monkey generates commercially viable applications using only his tail. 
And then Dilbert says, yes, but mine are secure. And the last frame is you see this tail appears. So here's another one. <laughs> but the problem is your boss doesn't know how secure your product is. Right. And so you lose security. <laughs> OK. Now, this, this is as technical as I'm going to get. Well, no, I'll get more technical if I need to. Bitcoin has a very interesting trick in it that most people don't appreciate. A Bitcoin address is not a public key. Right? Well, let me give you my two-second Bitcoin introduction. Bitcoin is based on public key technology. Basically, an address represents a public key. I'll come back to that. And by holding the private key, you can then spend the money that's in that address. Right? <coughs> but there's an extra twist. And the extra twist is that a Bitcoin address is, in fact, not the public key. It's the hash of the public key. It's actually two hashes, back to back, with different algorithms of the public key. Yeah, because the because the if it's a public key, it can't be that short. Not only yes, but there's an extra security property, which is I can't attack the public key if I don't have it. And and if the hash is reliable it, enough, you can't revert it unless you use rainbow tables. Right. But, but definitely a bit. A public key is not going to be in a rainbow table right. anyway. Right. So knowing a Bitcoin address does not means you do not know the public key. But what happens is when you spend the money, the transaction that spends it says, here's the public key, and here's a signed statement saying, I hereby spend the money by transferring it to this other address. This other transaction, but that's a detail. And then the way you verify the authenticity of the transaction is you take the public key that's been disclosed, you make sure the private key, public key operations work right, <coughs> i.e. the public key signs the transaction, and then you hash that disclosed public key to see if you get the address. And if you do, you win. And it's good. However, you defeat this if you ever use the same address again. So in Bitcoin, I have money that's associated with an address when I spend it, I can send, you know, let's say I have an address with 10 Bitcoins in it. There's this thing called a change address. If I want to give you one Bitcoin, the other nine have to go somewhere. And what the default software does in most cases is it sends the U to one Bitcoin and then it creates a new address, which is a new key pair, and it puts the other nine coins there. This also improves the anonymity of Bitcoin. But what some people do is they have software that says, okay, Take the one coin, give it to you, take the other nine, roll it back into the original address. But that address has now had its public key revealed. It's a little teeny bit less secure. Okay. Of course, the public key system they use is, uh, is uh, elliptic curve cryptography with curves that were issued by the NSA. So, so uh, are they still using that one from the, the NSA one? Hmm? Are they still using the elliptic curve? Red? Yeah, using P, uh, NIST P two fifty six. I thought so. This not the this not an oh yeah, the compromise one was used for pseudo random numbers. Yeah, yeah, no, that's different. There's an interesting question whether we believe that the the uh, elliptic curves published by NIST with NSA's help back in the late nineteen nineties or even actually mid nineteen nineties were good or bad. And I can argue it both ways. Well, one of them is what's used in Bitcoin. But by hashing it, at least you're sort of protected. Um, so that's an interesting trick. And the reason I mention this in the talk about the Internet of Things is I'd say, so what I might do for my update protocol is not put the public key in my firmware, but put a hash of the public key in the firmware. And then as part of the software update, I also update the key for the next update. So it's installed is a hash of the public key, which I will reveal when I publish an update. And then I will then rotate the key at the same time by supplying a new hash that will be used for the next update. So what it means, uh, after every update, the key will be revoked and a new key will be used? No. That after every update, the <coughs> key will only be usable for that one update. Yeah, so what it means for the next update is revoked? Doesn't, no, it's not revoked. It's just not used. Right. It won't be valid for the next update. And yes, so that means that somebody who has a device that needs to be updated and they fail to take the update, over time they become more at risk in case somebody factors the key or breaks the, the, the public key system. But this trick at least provides you some security for the people who have So what do you mean you must updated. constantly update or you will be more and more dangerous? Hmm? So what do you mean you have to constantly update or you will be more and more dangerous? No, because again, if you don't do an update, 
And then all that's out there is a hash of a public key. So now the attacker has to undo the hash. And if you did what Bitcoin did, it's two different hashes. So you got to undo two different hashes. And you threw information away while you were at it. Um, it's, I think, an intractable problem. Unless you have started with bad entropy. And let me tell you, the guys who do Bitcoin, they know about entropy. All right? There's this thing they call a brain wallet. So the problem with Bitcoin is you've got to store the private key somewhere, right? Most places where people put the private key, they get it stolen. So the concept of a brain wallet is effectively your private key is a password, which only you know, and it's never written down anywhere, so therefore it can't get stolen. Well, guess what? If you can remember it, it's going to be stolen. Because it has social engineering. Not even social engineering. So I was experimenting with this, okay? And I, I got this Chrome extension called Crypto something. I haven't actually installed in this machine. It's a little Chrome extension for playing with Bitcoin. And I said, all right, I'll use a brain wallet with it. And I picked a password-based address. And I put $5 in it. Within a second, it was stolen. Within one second. If you looked on the blockchain, it was like right there. It was in right instantaneously. Uh, my transaction putting the $5 in, another transaction taking it out and putting it somewhere else. You mean, so is, is, so is, did you write this plugin for an experiment? No, no, I didn't write it. I downloaded it. In fact, my first thought was, what's wrong with this plugin? It's stealing and sending the keys off. <laughs> so I, you know, it's in JavaScript. So I, so I decompile the JavaScript and I go tearing through it and I don't find anything wrong. And then it dawned on me. Someone went and took a vast password dictionary and generated all the bitcoins you would generate from it. And they have a bot out there just waiting for somebody to put money on one of those addresses. So they are looking at every single transaction hitting the blockchain, even before it gets put into a block, just you know, going into the pool of transactions and immediately seeing, is this address one of the ones I have in my table? And if so, go steal it. So which means don't use a weak password. And don't use bad entropy. Right. Okay, don't use bad entropy. And uh, what's interesting, by the way, is I've been following that money. It ain't going anywhere. So whatever bot stole it and put it in, it's still parked in that address. Because I've been watching to see if it moves. And it's not moving. And I wonder if this botnet, which is do doing this, is still under control of its original owners. Or well, God help them, they may have lost the keys. <laughs> <laughs> so the money's just gone. But it's gone. It's the same as if you took hundred dollar bills and flushed them down the toilet. Except I didn't put hundred dollars on it. Burned it. Yeah, you burned it. You burned it. Flush it down the toilet. You can recover. Yes, you can recover it. You have to know where to go. But yes. <laughs> um, what was it? So you can eat it. Right? Um, so, actually, there's a great so, uh, YouTube video. So you mean actually the system, with the brainwash system actually used your password as an entropy for keys? Yeah, it was, it was the key. The key. So they didn't even use the password as an entropy. They directly used it as a key. Right, That's because that way there's no storage. Right. Right, if you <coughs> use it as a password to protect the storage. By the way, another great bug in Bitcoin, in my opinion, okay, is by default, Bitcoin wallets weren't encrypted. So viruses would get onto your machine, they'd look for wallet.dat, and it's game over. Right. Now I think the default is to encrypt it. But it doesn't encrypt the whole file, it only encrypts the private keys. Which means, if I get my hands on your wallet.dat file, I don't need your private keys to determine how much money's in it. That's public. <laughs> so I, if I get your wallet.dat, I can find out how much it's worth before I determine how much effort I'm going to take to try to break the password. If the wallet's worth three bucks, I'm not going to bother. If the wallet's worth $100,000, it might be worth, say, spending $1,000 on AWS to break it. To, to break it, because I got to pay back of $100,000, guaranteed. I just have to do it before the owner notices I exfiltrated the file. But, ever notices. by the way, the story I said about the guy who had <laughs> Bitcoin stolen from his computer, it was a Macintosh, and he brought it to the Apple store. Okay? And Bitcoin transactions are time stamped. The transaction that stole his money occurred, occurred an hour before his Mac was booted, because of course he got the Mac back, it was repaired, and I think he had a fan problem or something. And so the Mac wasn't on, which means using the Mac disk mode, they sucked the hard drive out. Now, 
That's not unexpected. If you're running a repair shop, and you give me your machine, I might be worried I might damage the hard drive while I'm repairing it, and I don't want to lose your data, so I'm probably going to want to suck all the data out and put it in safe storage while I work on your machine. So that's not unreasonable. But they were pawing through it. And I suspect, by the way, that wallet.dat files were not the only thing they were looking for. As a friend, as a, as a, if you guys know Warren Weinstein, so you mean someone at the Apple shop is an evil mate? Yeah. So, so as, as Warren Weinstein says, advice to the celebrities with their with their phones, with their iPhones, after this whole nonsense about iCloud getting compromised, he said, you know, guys, two pieces of advice. One piece of advice: two-factor authentication. Second piece of advice: don't take naked pictures of yourself with your phone. I think the first, third, really? Please. The third advice. Good. Change your password. Well, yeah, you should do that. Yeah, because a weak password is always the best thing to compromise. So that's the end of my. Started to tell a story about YouTube and got video into YouTube. Video. Oh yeah, there's a great video by a guy who goes by the name of Vsauce, and the, and I think the search term is how much money is in the world. And he talks about how much cash is in the world and all the different types of money supply. He talks about how you can alter the money supply. You can burn money. You know, some celebrities in the UK that actually on. They did a video and they burned a million dollars. I'm not sure it's illegal. You know, I think it was it was in the UK. It was probably the equivalent of destroying currencies. Yeah. Well, it's certainly stupid. <laughs> you, you remember the old thing, take the penny, put it on the railroad? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's technically illegal. I know that's technically yeah. illegal. As well, those machines that you can put the penny in and you can turn it yeah, and watch it, you know. Well, no, the, the, the bank rating machine is trade. not for fraudulent purposes, and the Fed has specifically said it's exempt. Ah, okay. I guess they're not worried about you squashing pennies. But if you squash the penny so that it's the size of a nickel and will go in a washing machine at your college. Yeah, that's different. <laughs> Anyhow, do people want me to talk about the Fido key? Sure, sure. Yeah, I actually have one. So here's the problem. So the problem is people choose horrible passwords. So the first round solution was two-factor authentication through a six-digit code that's on a dongle or on an app on your phone or is sent to you via a text message. This works for 99% of people. But there's 1% that it doesn't work on, and that's the people who are very high net worth individuals who have money worth stealing or who have cool Twitter handles that somebody wants to steal, uh, yes, I know. or have some other you know, thing about them that makes them a particular target. So the first thing you learn is text-based second factors are trivial to forge because you just if you learn the person's phone number, you call up their carrier, and you social engineer the carrier. That's been done. Um, I know that someone lost his Twitter handler because GoDaddy and PayPal was social engineered and yep. his domain was gone. And his Twitter was on his domain mail, so he, the, the, his mail box got altered and mm -hmm. his Twitter yeah, so was actually, There's an interesting piece of advice I can tell you from that, which is, you might not like to hear this, but if you own domains, it's a real good idea to use a Gmail account as the domain owner. Because the problem you run into is, you might think, I mean, I have a domain, qiv.net, and for a long time, the, the domain owner was gis at qiv.net. But if somebody stole qiv.net, they, 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 I'm done. That's what happened when Boston Computer Society, I owned, I, I owned the, actually, the uh, IP addresses. Mm -hmm. And I was under my Media One. Yeah. Media One went away. <laughs> I so have to go through all sorts of hoops to, to get it back. So so you mean but, this, but I'm saying something more fundamental, which is if you have a domain name where the administrator account is at that domain, yes. if somebody manages to fraudulently steal the domain, you've lost control of it because you can't prove who you are. Yes. To so, so you mean not only so you you simply <coughs> cannot use the domain's mailbox at the domain's admin account. Right. So you're not saying specifically Gmail. You're just saying something. No, specific. Gmail is what I would use for several reasons. First of all, because you don't have to worry about the gmail.com domain being stolen. There are a lot of very high paid people who make sure that doesn't happen. Okay? So, Gmail has the best security story in terms of two-factor authentication. I mean, you could use a Microsoft account or a Yahoo account, but I don't think their security story is as good. 
So there's a better security story at Gmail. That's my opinion. And, and the Gmail account you use should be one that has a, you know, you've turned on two-factor authentication. But so let me go on. So that's the first weakness, is that text messages can be screwed with. But there's another issue, okay, which is, and, and people have done this. They've set up a site that looks like your banking site. You go to it because you're sort of steered towards it, and what they're doing is they're talking to your real bank on the back end. So they're they're doing pass through. Actually, this is not something strange. I, this happened in China many times before, and because many many people on the internet in China aren't well trained, and they use Internet and Explorer and well six. Here. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? They use IE six, right. so there's no green. Um, address bars, there's no big SSL certificate. The, did you notice that their web page is not encrypted and they thought it was the real page? Yeah. So what these guys do is they do, so they sit in the middle and then your bank says enter the six digit code and they ask you enter the six digit code. You enter the six digit code, they enter the six digit code. Right, stop. Main the middle attack. They're in the middle, and now they let you conduct your business. Life's good, everything's fine. And then you say, okay, I'm done, log out. Of course, uh, they don't pass that on. So and now that you're gone, we'll yeah. do a few more transactions. So they log out and log in again. No, they can't log in again because that requires a different six character password. That's what the one time thing is supposed to address. Oh, well, this is the question for the one time password. This is how they get around even an app generated one time password. Because the authentication was one time, but they're in the middle. Main the middle attack is not a strange thing now. Now, no, it's not. Now, the way these FIDO keys address that is there's two ways you can use it. First of all, it's doing a real digital signature based on a secret value stored only in the token and never revealed. Okay? So, if you used it merely to log into the bank, so let me put it this way. All security technology used wrong does not help. Right. So if the bank says, okay, at login time, we're going to do the, the handshake thing, and you touch the little button on the token, you're logged in, but if they don't do anything further than that, then you're no better off. But the bank can do two different things with this, to with this token that they can't do with a six-character password. One thing they can do is they can say every transaction where you're moving money has to be signed. So they generate a hash of the transaction, which you can <coughs> use as a challenge, and you have to go dink and touch the key to approve the transaction. And you put up on the screen, touch key to approve transaction. <coughs> and so each transaction is verified by you touching this key. It doesn't matter if the bad guy's in the middle, there's nothing they can do. Now, I don't see banks doing that simply because it's a usability issue. But what they can do is they can use as the challenge what's called the SSL master secret. And that would stop a man in the middle attack. Because if they're in the <coughs> middle, then you're using a different SSL session to the server than they're using. So they can basically say to you, so you need support in the browser for that, to say, we're not going to send you the challenge. The challenge is the SSL master secret. Use that and, and send me a signature of that. And now that's the or maybe they can use the SSL master secret as a key if you sign something. For example, the uh, use the SSL master secret to sign the mm, the maybe the ID number of your token, and then it will be even harder for them to forge it. No. No. Well, the key is the is the master secret. You have to use the master secret to sign a value. Okay. Oh, so you mean the secret is dynamically generated after exchanging the... The SSL master secret is dynamically generated with an SSL session between two endpoints. Is yeah, so first there was handshake and they will then exchange what they support and they will generate a key, right? Yeah. So, so the SSL master secret is a shared secret between two endpoints. The important thing is it's, if there's a man in the middle, it'll be between, <coughs> between you and the man in the middle and the man in the middle and the bank. But the bank and you will not have the same master secret, and this will detect that. And well, the challenge will fail. But, but since you're in the man in the middle, if your software is sufficiently able to intercept... No, nope, nothing it can do. 
No, because you don't send the, you don't send the challenge. You don't say sign this. You say sign the master secret. Okay. The encryption between the man in the middle. The encryption is the backseat between the man in the middle. And so what will happen is if, if you say sign the master secret, <laughs> what you're going to do is you're going to sign the master secret that you're sharing with the man in the middle. And that the man in the middle will pass that, and they will find. No, but I'm asking, Oops. You, I'm asking you why the why the man in the middle can't see that that request is being made and do that and si not have you sign it. Do that sign and then pass that on. There has, but this needs support in the browser that we don't have yet. But then all this stuff's new anyway. Okay, I'm just interested. I understand I, what you're saying. I understand yeah, I, what you're I, saying. Yeah. And I was saying so, if you could protect against that. So that's my, okay, my point is you... I'll be interested because I don't see how you protect against that. Yeah. So actually, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Using the master secret to sign the <coughs> hardware ID of the token and send the <coughs> hardware ID sign of the master secret and the bank will still discover that because they are signing of different keys. Right, they'll discover that there's a man in the middle. That's the whole point. It's a revolution. Now, now, Oh, yeah, I know what you're reading. What? You're reading, I forget, the conservative guy who said that uh, when Obama announces the immigration it's plan... It's a major, major thing. It's going to ruin the country, actually. Right, it's right, that there'll be violence in the street. It should be, actually. And, uh, yeah. That's not so, going to So, the way that you're getting into well, this man in the middle the situation in the first place yeah. is by clicking on a disguised link in an mm -hmm. email. So well, it, if it's, you get something from your bank that says click here, you should just go directly from your browser and not go through the email. And it seems like that's well, duh. That's one way. But if I can control the DNS servers you're getting, mm -hmm. I well, can force you to go to the bad guy site you wouldn't know. Actually, I would like to address something. That was, there's, this was the security lead, um, secu security exploit discovered in Gmail by a mathematician. He teaches algorithms, so he knows that. One day he sent, he received a mail, box, a mail from Gmail saying that he had come something wrong, and he was puzzled. So he analyzed the 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 source code of the mail using HTML, and he noticed that the Google input, the Google login credential input, was simply a plain text input field rather than an iframe which Google would normally use. So he called his friends at Google, and Google says, there might be something wrong. We only use iframes. So what I find out is that they actually cracked. Um, I don't know, <coughs> I think you must know that because you work to build standards for, in, for the internet, is that the new standard, there's a standard which involves inserting a TXT record into a domain's DNS, which verifies the sender of is allowed in the domain. I can't remember its name, but there well, there's two. There's yes. DKIM and there's SPF. I think it's DKIM. Yeah. DKIM. Mm -hmm. And Google is using a weak DKIM key, which only consists of 256 bits. And the DKIM key has been... Has been 256 bits is enough. Uh, I can't remember 250 Keep in mind that DKIM is very weak protection. Yeah, uh, at we some don't put vault doors on paper mache houses. <laughs> somehow, <laughs> somehow the DKIM key gets being calculated by someone, and you use DKIM, the fake DKIM key to send a fake email. So if the bank is also and the mathematician also published in his article that many banks have the same problem. Now the Google banks have a huge problem, and it's not that. Okay. One of the things that I find frustrating as somebody who's very security knowledgeable is the things that come out that really are not serious problems at the press because they don't know the difference. Some guy says, oh, I found a problem, and they throw a bunch of equations up, and the press says, ah, oh, run, you know, was it uh, uh, Chicken Little? The sky is falling, the sky is falling. And then, of course, people become immune to this kind of nonsense. Um, there was one just today about apparently uh, if, you, if, if you can get across, you can steal information from an air gapped network. All right? Mm -hmm. But to do it, you first of all have to get a specially crafted virus onto the target machine. And oh, by the way, they don't mention in the article, the hard, this is hardware, you know, the virus has to be targeted to that particular piece of hardware. 
because it's going to modulate it into an FM radio. Okay? And then you have to have a radio receiver within range of that to receive it. Isn't this only <coughs> university research, which is almost impossible for everyday usage? I understand, but the point is, trade prices, oh, we should all worry about this. No, we shouldn't. We should worry about grandma choosing a three-character password. <laughs> all right? The guys who can get, the guys who can the area have a number, that way have much better ways to do it. Yeah, I mean, as Marcus Ranum used to say, you know, they can use techniques like rubber hose cryptoanalysis. Yeah. <laughs> That's where they beat you with a rubber, rubber hose, hose until you yes. get off the keys. Uh, years ago, I was doing consulting at all, of all places, the Pentagon. And uh, this was in the 1990s when the clipper chip and key escrow was all, all the rage. And so I had this guy who was a deputy undersecretary of defense for defense policy support. I was about to give a talk to the direct reports of the Secretary of Defense, which included, by the way, the Deputy Director of the NSA, <laughs> who I became friends with. And uh, ah, that's why you worked for the Yeah, that's why I worked for the NSA. Uh, and what happened was, uh, losing my train of thought. Oh, yeah, so I decided to give him some grief. I said, what's this nonsense about the clipper chip and all these keys and all this key escrow nonsense? And he looked at me and said, that's not us. That's the FBI. <laughs> We're the military. If we want the keys, We'll get the keys. They'll <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the uh, the uh, cyber people really, even cybersecurity people, sometimes don't understand security. Uh, I had a senior person who, because we didn't take, I won't name who it is, or what the company was, but we were having dinner, and he was showed me. This was an administrative employee. This is not a techie guy, right? And he showed me he had a, a card access to the, to the secure keying facility where they generated their most valuable secrets and signed their most powerful certificates. And I looked at him and I said, you know, that's really cool. It's cool that you have that. Why do you have that? Well, because I'm a senior guy and I'm up in the hierarchy and you know, so I get to have the magic card. I said, why do you want the magic card? I got a great idea. After we're done with our dinner here, let's go down to the, the skiff and sign some certs. Well, I wouldn't do that. How about a million bucks? I'll give you a million bucks. We can go sign certs. I have my integrity. Okay. Ten million. I'm not available for any price. I said, okay. My partner has your wife and baby at gunpoint right now. And it was cool. The color just drained right out of him. <laughs> a week later, I, he said, yeah, I got rid of that card. <laughs> so actually, the, if the meter wants it, they will use a gun to force you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so, always put things in that perspective, okay, is, you know, who is the enemy? Again, what's the threat model, okay? I mean, personally, I'm not worried about somebody using text messages to get into my Gmail account because, you know, I don't have anything that's worth that level of effort, okay? And, you know, if I did, I'd try to figure out how to on Google do I disable the text message aspect of it. Um, so, it's, you know... If someone really good goes after you, okay, you know, if I was going after you, I'd probably start a fire in your backyard so you're out of your house. You know, notice, keep you off balance, out of sorts. Uh, I was talking to a, a certain commercial company I was doing some consulting for, and I said, now, this is a, a story about how sometimes security is counterintuitive. What I said is your security and networking people should be able to access your infrastructure from home and do what they need to do from home. And they said, Jeff, you're nuts. That's a huge security violation. It's a huge security exposure. I said, yeah, but here's the problem. If I'm going to do a cyber attack against you, I'm going to call your network operations center. Chances are it's the 800 number. I don't even have to pay for the call. And I'm going to call, and I'm going to say, I'm going to call in a bomb threat. And you know, you're not the military. You're not the government. You have to evacuate. You, you have to treat that as credible. You have to notify the authorities, and the authorities may well tell you that you have to evacuate. And they said, well, we have a backup network operations center. And I looked at them, and I said, so I make two phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, chances are, you automatically route the phone number to the backup, so... My algorithm is actually very simple. I keep calling the 800 number until no one answers. <laughs> yep. And now I have you. And now I launch my cyber attack. 
while you're running around trying to figure out, and all your best people are standing in the street in the rain. Now, if the security people work from home, what is special about their home? It's the one place they can't be forced to evacuate from. They're, ge they're geographically dispersed. A threat against them is not credible. Now, maybe I could threaten one of them. You know, the guy who lives in East Rutherford, New Jersey, well, I, but you have other people. And so by doing that, you'll have somebody on duty. So what, what I would have to do is find all their home phone numbers and call them threats against But then the phone bill will be a good thing. <laughs> well, and then they have to be taken as... And to do that, you have to have some way of knowing that you actually... Yeah, I mean, it, you make it much yeah, harder. It's much harder. <coughs> you make it much harder. And like you said, they don't have to evacuate unless they personally believe it. Right. Also, if you got to the point where you have the home phone numbers, then instead of doing that, I would probably try to attack it with the denial of service. Well, actually, if I know all the home phone numbers, I might try to turn one of those employees. Yeah, turn one of the employees, okay. or in the case of the attack you said, you might try to demand service again. Because, you know, when people talk about you know, the NSA infiltrating Google, yeah, or, what's, or, sorry. What's, or to say, well, what's to say that there aren't NSA employees working undercover as Google employees, and what's to say there aren't employees of other national intelligence services, Russia, China, North Korea, okay, that aren't working as Google and look, you know, like... Uh, Oh, a lot of Orient people Google. Yeah. <laughs> I said it's Right. And so the uh, you know, people are not always what they seem, you know? And so against that level of threat, it's a whole different game. And Google, by the way, is probably very vulnerable to this problem because Google's one of the companies that on, when you're on the inside, there aren't very many barriers. It's not very compartmented. Amazon is very compartmented. Google is not. So if you can get yourself hired as a software developer at Google, all right, then you know you probably have access to lots of interesting things. Uh, they may eventually catch you, but you'll probably get a lot of stuff before they do. And so the uh, but you know guess what? A, a you know well a state actor is probably not going to try to steal money. That's petty crime. Okay. But there may be things that involve Google that, you know, do rise to that. I don't know what they are off the top of my head. But again, NSA. what's your threat signing, model? among other things. Hmm? Certificate signing, among other things. Well, the problem with the certificate signing is it's easy to change them. If Google is suspicious that their certificates are compromised, it's fa fairly easy to change them. Because some people can update with the new certificate and the old certificate can be revoked safely. Safely, and Google actually has an extra little thing with Chrome, which is they can blacklist the certificates in Chrome. Chrome actually has its own out-of-band certificate validation mechanism. That's not standard. And it doesn't use the standard one. No, because the standard one doesn't work. Uh, so, you know, a lot of spins like that. One last thing I'm going to say, by the way, about these FIDO tokens. It's a cool thing about them, which is not well understood, is if I, so I have like five different Google accounts. So I get one of these tokens. I actually bought two because Google lets you have more than one associated with an account. So one I have with me and one stays home. So I have a spare. But never mind the spare. I use the same one on all five accounts, but Google doesn't know that. The way these things work is if I use it on two different services, the services cannot collude and say, oh, that's the same guy because it never reveals anything that's unique about it. So they never send its hardware ID, never send anything? No. Um, because the way it works is when you register, well, there's got to be some way it figures out which one to send. It also will work with an infinite number of sites because it has no storage. It only stores one secret AES key. It's the only storage it has. In its read-only memory? What? So there's only one AES key stored in its room. It's in its secure element. So it's a key you cannot extract. Right. Okay? That it can use when, under appropriate circumstances. So when you use these things, it's actually a two-step process. The first step is enrollment. When you enroll it at a website, it generates a key pair just for that website. It then encrypts the private key with the secret that's inside it. 
and it provides back to the website a package of the unencrypted public key and the encrypted private key. And then what happens is when you log in, the website delivers to the key the encrypted private key and a challenge. And it decrypts the private key and then uses the, the, the revealed private key to encrypt the challenge and send it back. So you mean the token still needs to be plugged into your computer? To yes. Work. And you actually have to touch it. Ah. So what happens is when a request is made to please do a signature, this little light on it lights up. And touch it? And you touch its capacitive switch. You touch it and then it does the signature. What, what is it used for the encrypt, to encrypt the private key? AES. So it's got... So it has another key in there. It has an AES key in its secure element mm -hmm. that it oh, uses hardware okay. protection. So it actually contains some sort of TPM. That's right. It's unique okay. on each one of these. Yeah, yeah so, so it's that's still... That's, that's a specific private key is being generated by the remote website? No, it's generated by the key. Oh. There is a TPM inside processing this stuff, right? Yeah, so I guess it's making so this there's argument. a weakness in generating that key pair. It needs to have. It needs to have a, a good. It needs two things. It needs to have secure storage of the AES key, and it needs to have a good entropy source. Entropy source. Uh, and a, a good TPM should contain this too. So, which means, unless you can compromise the TPM, you cannot compromise the key. Now, what I would like to see going forward, okay? The only, the only problem with the USB key is, where do I put it? Hmm. Well, I do have a micro USB port here, so I guess I could plug an adapter cable in and. Yeah, sure. I'm going to do that. But on the other hand, and, and sort of, it's sort of bad we went in the wrong direction. It'd be cool if that same secure element that was in the USB key was embedded in the hardware of this phone. And then there was like a spot on the screen that was the thing I have to push. And that's hardwarely connected to the secure element. So there's no operating system support involved at all. And then I have it tied to my phone which I have with me all the time. And I don't have to worry about what connectors I plug into what. And there were phones that came out that had secure elements that could do this, but not enough manufacturers opted to put them in, so the ones that had became albatrosses. And so now, for things like Google Wallet, which use the secure element, they now do this thing called HCE, host card emulation, which is a virtual secure element, which isn't particularly secure. Because software implemented. Because it needs to be in software so it can be widely deployed. And again, you make a trade-off. The company says, we'll take a risk with the, with the software secure. The way it actually works, which is not documented anywhere, by the way, but I figured this out by playing with it. If you have Google Wallet from years ago, you can unlock your wallet even when you're offline. Today, you can only unlock the wallet when you're online, because what it does is when you unlock the wallet, it does a proprietary transaction to Google, which downloads the secure element virtual key onto the phone, which is then used by the Google Wallet. And when you quote, unquote, lock the wallet, it deletes it. So my wallet right now is locked, so the key is not resident on it. So it, so it uses some sort of key exchange to download its key? Yeah. Now, the other interesting thing is ARM, the modern ARM chips, yeah. have an operating mode called Secure World, which is a whole different hardware operating mode that has access to unique memory that it only has access to in Secure Mode. So what it means? It basically has a built-in TPM. Basically. And it's used on some phones. This phone actually uses it for the uh, credential storage. If I install a certificate on this phone, it's the virtual TPM that's storing it. So there are things that are, that are cool that are happening. Um, what phone? This is the OnePlus One, the phone that's made of unobtainium. Uh, you know, you have to get the invite in order to buy it. Hopefully that will change soon. It's a very nice phone. But my friends tell me don't do anything secure with it because it's made in China. <laughs> MSS inside. Which I guess is the English initials of the Chinese NSA. <laughs> so Jeff, what happens when you lose the, the FIDO key or, uh, you know, and you've got your bank accounts and everything else? Well, that's the, one of the really big problems. In my case, I have a spare at home. Mm -hmm. And I still have the six character thing turned, six digit thing turned on. Mm -hmm. So I can fall back to that. But the big problem, and this is, a, a, to, to me, an unsolved problem is all these technologies have a fatal flaw, which is the account recovery problem. <laughs> you know, grandma loses the token. Grandma loses her phone. Grandpa sits on it. By the way, you know the number one way phones get destroyed, right? It involves a toilet. 
And uh, so I learned that the hard way a year or so ago. So, well, if you have to put them on their pants, and anyhow. Problem is, how do you recover someone's account? And by the way, if you Google, the number of account recovery requests they get is measured in thousands per day. So they can't do a lot of vetting. They can't devote like an assistant to spend any real time with you because they don't have that much staff. So I believe with Gmail, if you, if you lose all your second factors, and you know, you're done. You're never going to get your account back. Asterisk. There is a way. You have to know someone. But a lot of stuff with Google translates to, if you know someone on the inside, you can work your way to the right people and you can usually win. Particularly if you're a celebrity or a journalist. But um, for the rest of us, well, who knows. But yeah, but that's why they, they give you the backup codes and they want you to register a telephone. They're walking the trade-off. They'd like to make your account as secure as possible, but also recognize that you may lose anything they give you. So hopefully you won't lose your backup codes, your app for generating codes, and your phone. And oh, by the way, you can have it call your home phone and read you the code. And you won't lose your home phone all on the same day. I don't want you to then, yeah, then you're just going to lose your account, and that's all they can do. Um, which creates a problem for things like the National Strategies for Trust in Cyberspace. NSTIC, which is a government program, the government desperately wants to figure out how to authenticate people so we can use digital access to the government, like, say, to the IRS for paying our taxes or to Social Security for arranging for our benefits. Well, and I'm not speaking for the government because I don't know what the government does, but I, my bet is the government doesn't want to be in the business of authenticating people. They'd like to have that go out to third parties. They'd love Google. You know, you'd use your Gmail account to authenticate to the U.S. government, but then you better not lose your Gmail account. And so that's a problem. Some countries use the post office for that function to issue certificates. And our post office wanted to. They even went and built a data center and outfitted it with certificate signing stuff. But our post office doesn't have any money. And the problem is that what they would have to charge for the service, people can't pay. So it's a conundrum. It's not, this is an unsolved problem, how to do this. This one maybe you want to do. In general, you do because it's way much more efficient. I don't want to do it. Well, you don't have a choice. You know about the scam against colleges recently and phishing attacks? No. I mean, I know BU, some Chinese BU students lost their credit card. I don't know why. Oh, it's worse than that. A school in the Boston area, someone was phishing employees' credentials and then going to the payroll site. And the day before payroll, they changed the bank account on a large number of people to send their direct deposit to an account in Minneapolis, which means they were stupid because they did get caught. And then the next day, after the paychecks were done, they went and put it all back. So when you said, I didn't get paid, and the university looked, oh, well, it says here, uh, the Bank of Boston account number such and so. Is that your account? Yes. Well, that's where we sent the money. But I don't have the money. And eventually they unraveled it and figured out what happened. And the university was out the money. I think it was $7 million before they discovered this problem. Do, did you actually have a log of everything, right? I would assume they did. So the problem is, which university? <laughs> uh, being recorded. <laughs> when you ask me when I know the tape's off. Um, yeah, that's about the brewery. So one of the things, by the way, that MIT just recently did with piloting two-factor authentication on our touchstone authentication system. And of course, we've been using certificates for a very long time. And our certificates are not as good a two-factor as I'd like, but they're better than nothing. So we've been a harder than normal target. Um, because guess what? I can go change my direct deposit information uh, using my credentials. And I bet you if I called up payroll and I said, you know, payroll, I'd really rather not do this online. If I'm going to change my direct deposit information, I don't want to come to your office and do it in person. I'll say, no, not an option. We're not going to disable it for you. Protect your password. Have it on stay. <laughs> And so, but the problem is, if if you can remember your password, then someone else can steal that. Well, this is why we want to turn on two-factor authentication. Right. Now, MIT, we've partnered with a company called Duo Security. Uh, their secret sauce is they do the six the six-digit code too, but they also do push notification to your phone. 
So what do you mean if something goes wrong with your phone? Well, you well, are... If somebody tries to log... Well, when I log in, okay, I get presented with a choice. How do I want to do the second factor? Do I want to type in a code, which I have to do if I have no internet access on my phone? Do I want them to text me some codes? Or do I want to do push? And if I say push, which is the default, then the app on the phone wakes up and I get a little dialogue that says, hey, you're logging in from this IP address. Allow, deny. I push allow, I'm logged in. The idea is that people don't like typing the six-digit code, so now we've turned it into one button push. And uh, so that's their you know, claim to fame. There's only one thing I don't like about it, as somebody on the back end, is it's a cloud-based service. Mm. So, I can, I, so I can infiltrate the infrastructure and then you're doomed. No, that's not really the problem. The problem is if I'm not on the net, yes. if they cut our internet access, then we can't log in. Okay? But there's still a text message option, right? Um, yeah. Maybe that works. Maybe if I DDoS their infrastructure, that doesn't work. <laughs> because that's the other thing. When you get the little prompt, it's actually JavaScript <laughs> running in the browser that's talking directly to their infrastructure. So chances are, I can't even get that far. All right, we'll do one. I really didn't take formal questions. Let me take questions, and then we'll call them the night. Yes? Is security still inversely proportional to privacy, and is it still represented by an imaginary number? <laughs> I never believed that, by the way. Security is only <coughs> inversely proportional to privacy when you look at it very simplistically. To the world I live in, security is the same as privacy. It depends on who the actors are. Keep in mind, some people view um, security equals surveillance. But that's how you should do it, security. And actually, I'm going to say something else here that you just tickled me on, which is back in the 1970s when cell phones, cell phone, actually 19, early 1990s when analog cell phones first came out, it was trivial to listen in on cell phone calls. All you needed was a radio receiver on 800 megahertz, and you could go listen to cell phone calls. Rather than arranging for those calls to be <coughs> encrypted, the government said, well, we'll make it illegal to sell the receivers. <laughs> that way, only the government could do it. Ha, ha, ha. The government, or at least large parts of it, have not gotten past that mentality. The problem is, when so much stuff is done in software, you <coughs> cannot say, thou shalt not. Heck. You Nick can't Gingrich prevent me from listening to 800 megahertz because I can use a software-defined radio. Nick Gingrich is a believer now. What? They recorded his cell phone, his, uh, cell yeah. phone conversation. Amazing how congressmen work. If you get them, <laughs> oh, that's different. <laughs> that's different. Clearly, we need encrypted cell phones for congressmen. And uh, ex-congressmen. Yeah, ex-congressmen. Yeah, thank you. So the point is that the government needs to recognize that we need to improve security standards, even if that means locking out the government. Uh, one of the pieces of advice I gave to the Pentagon in 1996 when I was there is I said, you know, what you would probably like is a secure U.S. Internet and an insecure global Internet. And that's a choice you cannot have. The options are a secure global Internet or an insecure global Internet. Choose one. You don't get the hybrid. And that's true today, too. So I believe that security can enhance privacy. It depends on who controls it. And that's and one of the reasons I was never a big fan of the TPM chips, for example, is the original motivation of TPM was DRM. <laughs> right? That TPM chip in the computer wasn't in my computer helping me. I was the adversary. Its purpose in life was to protect content authors against me. From pirating. From pirating, right. Yellow. Which, by the way, well, that's a whole other discussion, but it only stops the bad, it only stops the good guys, not the bad guys, so it just annoys everybody. It's like trying to teach a pig to sing. But uh, Bruce Schneier has a great quote, by the way, about DRM. Trying to come up with digital data that can't be copied is like trying to come up with water that isn't wet. Yeah. Is it still a theoretical state? What? Security. What do you mean is a theoretical state? Okay. I mean, like everything, there's a spectrum. You'll never get perfect security. Um, 
We just have to move the needle. By the way, there's a great talk, I forget the name of the talk, that Dan Gear gave him on, on the whole security stuff, and he's spot on. The, in his view, the world actually isn't that broken, okay? Because we're all still breathing, right? Yes, the bad guys are attacking, the bad guys are stealing, but they're not stealing enough that, we, that we're putting our computers away. And so, you know, but really we just need to slide that security needle a little further over so that there's less theft going on. And it happens, so I'll give you an example. We don't have chip and pin in this country on our credit cards. And part of that is because the incentives are wrong. The organizations that can affect the implementation of chip and pin are not the ones who lose money when cards are stolen. Because it's the credit card networks that have to control that, but when money's stolen, it's either stolen from the consumer's bank or it's stolen from the merchant, it's never stolen from them. So why should they spend money to save somebody else? They've only been recently shamed into it because the level of threat of theft got to a point where they really couldn't, you know, say, oh, what, who, us? So in some ways, the best way to get security is to make sure that the stakeholders are in line with the risk. Now, the problem is, when we run into trouble with security, is if my security is dependent on the expenditure of that guy over there who doesn't care about me, we're screwed. And keep in mind, any business that says, our mission is to offer wonderful groceries. No, it's not. Your mission is to make money. Offering groceries is the mechanism by which you do that. Yes, sir? If you were to use Cliff Stoll's The Cuckoo's Egg as a benchmark and then go to today, where, where would you say we are, better or worse? You know? um, well, it's hard to say. For the one thing, more of our economy is in cyberspace. Right. Right? In the days of the cuckoo's egg, you know, there were just us cuckoos that were actually using computers. Okay? <laughs> Nowadays, you know, our whole economy is based on them. And so the pie got a whole heck of a lot bigger. And obviously the amount that was being stolen got bigger too. Um, I actually believe the dynamics of, I don't want to call it a market, but there is this sort of pendulum where you are going to see an improvement in security now. We're going to see chip and pin. Is it perfect? No. Is it better than what we have? Yes. Um, we're going to see things get better, I think, for a little while. But, you know, the bad guys are out there, and they're going to try real hard to steal. Um, and as long as we don't have the losing individual, see, that's what I worry about. I worry about the case where, as a society, we're okay, but every once in a while, someone gets destroyed. You know, some individual gets hacked and they lose their house, they lose their car, they lose their livelihood, and they're on the street starving and living in shelters. They were personally ruined by things they could not control. We need to prevent that from happening. That's the thing that I really worry about. You know, the cost of society, if I as an individual have to spend $100 a year to you know, ensure our society against the losses of the bad guys, so effectively the bad guys are still in 100 bucks a year from me, I don't care. I don't care whether I spend that hundred bucks on security or I spend that hundred bucks on protection. I don't care. You know, my dad had a bookkeeper many years ago. The guy stole a hundred dollars a month. And my dad said, he knew all about it. He told me. He's a great bookkeeper, but he's stealing a hundred bucks a month. And I said, well, why don't you call him on it? And he said, you know, because he's a really good bookkeeper, I'm not paying him a ton of money. So I just consider it part of his salary because he does a great job. And see, the thing is, by he's, by he's taking that hundred bucks, he thinks he's pulling it on me. So he feels great about himself. He thinks he's smarter than I am. If I say to him, I know about it, even if I don't take any sanction, I'm going to ruin the guy. I don't want to do that. And he never told him until the day he died. We went to his funeral, and we said great things about him. So there's a certain price we're willing to pay. I just don't want one individual or one group of individuals to pay a huge price for the rest of society. That's what we have to protect from this. <coughs> yes? Mm, this is a question which I'd like to ask. You know, in China, we have a sensor system all around China, especially in the cyberspace. So do you have any suggestions on protecting ourselves from that level of national censorship? Because if they suspect you, they can easily put, get you into a big trouble. Well, that type of you know, the great firewall of China, as we refer to it here, would never work in the United States. It would never work in the United States. If, if word got out the government was going to do that, they would be held to pay. OK? 
okay? That just won't work here. There's a lot of things that won't work here. What works here is much more insidious, okay? Um, it's, you know, media outlets owned by, you know, this gets away from cybersecurity, but it's media outlets owned by a fewer and fewer individuals, okay? Um, I was browsing YouTube the other day. George Carlin, right, yeah, was amazingly right. prescient, right? He did a bit on the 1% screwing the 99% and the government doing something we don't pay attention. It's like, whoa, what, did he do that last year? No, he's dead. He did that in 1982, right? He also did a bit on, 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 on Save the Earth, a great line on Save the Earth. He basically said, no, nothing we can do is going to hurt the Earth. The Earth has seen much worse than us. Yeah. We'll screw ourselves. Yeah. The Earth will be fine. And so the thing is that uh, that's the kind of stuff we have to worry about in the United States. Too much communication power getting in too few hands that can then be corrupted. You know, who do you trust the news from? Now, everybody thought the blog sphere would solve all that, right? The problem is the blog sphere is noise. Okay? Pick any news story you want, right? You know, pick pick a, a story, right? Pick, you know, some, you know, pick the Pope having sex with a pig, and there's probably somebody there reporting it. Right? You could probably find a story about it. There's so much garbage out there, all right, that it's hard. That's in some sense what we want real journalists for, to sift through the garbage and tell us what's really true. The problem is that requires trust. And we have to trust them. And the problem is when it, when when so much of the media is in the hands of a very small number of individuals, and the purpose of the media is to make money. <coughs> it's to sell commercials. Right, it's to sell you subsets. And, you know, that, that is what I see as the risk to us, not the government saying we we'll put a firewall. That's way too, too uh, crass. Yeah, but I mean, just if you have to live in an environment like that, how can you protect yourself? Or well, maybe they're just normal procedures like strong passwords or encrypt what you can. Well, you know what Google does, right? Right. You don't take your laptop to China. That's my problem. Right. Um, and, you know, anything, any electronic device you take to China, you can assume is compromised. Right. Um, because not only does the Chinese government want to do that to foreigners, but they have the manpower to do it. Right? I mean, they have plenty of people who, you know, they, they can, if I went to China, I don't know if I'm high enough on the food chain to be worth their notice, but if I am, you know, they'll assign you a team of people. I right? guess that my device is already compromised when I, when I brought them out of the customs office. I, I, I come from China. Right, I figured that out. Yeah. Uh, if you lost your sight, it's gone. Right. Luckily, the laptop, which might have been compromised, has already been out of function because my roommate tripped its wire. So. So basically, if you're going to travel to China, you should buy a, lap, a throwaway laptop for that instead of a throwaway Google account to uh, access while you're there. Yep. Yeah, I just had a bunch of laptops I got rid of that were terminals. Now you see, they, this they ran an ultralight Linux <laughs> on, the, on the machine, and all it could do was phone home. Yeah, now you see, this phone I can take to China. Yeah. Because it came from there. Yeah, I, I, I just know one thing that. Um, because I mentioned earlier, we develop Linux and we know what's going on in China. Uh, I'd like to repeat that is that the Chinese government, one Chinese government sponsored enterprise is trying to build their own Linux operating system. It's based on Mint. Mm -hmm. And they also opened their own software centers with independent repositories. And it can be added to a standalone Debian or Ubuntu based system. And what we notice is that when it's added to a standard Debian, its repositories have a lot of new packages which will override some of the system infrastructure of an original Debian. And then we believe that it might compromise that installation. Yeah, I, I don't know, I can't comment on that. But yeah, so, I'm, so, so I think that's what I'm talking about. Anything you bring to China might be compromised. But as, as has been shown by the Snowden revelations, you know, any US manufactured equipment sent to China may be compromised by the NSA. I mean, this is what intelligence agencies do, right? I mean, this is the game that they play. They compromise each other. Right. And so, you know, 
So I was at the Topps Field Fair, and I took a selfie of myself with my phone, and I sent it over MMS to somebody I was talking to, and it occurred to me, you know, the NSA is probably, you know, if they're monitoring all the traffic here at the Topps Field Fair, they are probably gathering tons and tons and tons of crap. <laughs> you know, pictures of pigs, pictures of goats, pictures of people posing with the goats. I mean, I, you know, good. I, I'm only just a little disturbed that my tax dollars are paying for space in a data center, <laughs> you know, in Utah that's storing all this crap. What I'd like to know, if they're going to grab all my stuff, can they back it up for me? Do I really need to back it up? <laughs> can I just call them and say, hey, you know, I, I had a hard drive failure, can I, can I get this back? There was a Dilbert about that a couple months ago, yeah. every month, something like that, where he hacked into the NSA to get his data back and then he, they, they took him to jail and stuff. Yeah, so it's like, great. You know, let me be a real public service, right? Right. I mean, a guy the other day actually asked me for a reference for a job there, and I said, okay, I'll call my mom and tell her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.